Have we reached the end point of human philosophy? Think out a thousand or ten thousand years. It's obvious to everyone that human civilization, if it lasts, will make unimaginable leaps in science and technology in that time. On the other hand, there's a general sense, judging from the way we imagine the future, that our worldview won't change in any meaningful way. We seem to take for granted that the intuitive picture we have about who we are and our place in the world is just obviously true, and there's nothing we could learn that would change that picture. Is that really true? Is our worldview the best and most accurate? If so, then why are so many people lonely, unhappy, and unfulfilled? Why is there so much cruelty and injustice in the world? I'd say it's because we're far from the endpoint, and our collective worldview is frankly that of a childlike civilization in desperate need of an update. What could that update look like? I think the idea that most needs a re-examination is our understanding of selfhood. The conventional viewpoint is that every person has a unique soul that's separate from the rest of the universe. A person's soul is considered to be the thing that experiences their life and chooses their actions. It's the essence of a person. There's quite a good chance that you share this belief in some way. A September 2021 Pew Research study found that 73% of Americans believe they have a soul that persists after death, and a 2017 Pew study found that a similar percentage of Europeans believe the same. Even non-religious people tend to believe that their experience of life is separate from the rest of the universe, some unique and fundamentally different thing than everything else in existence. This independent selfhood idea is our heritage from a time before civilization, from our animal roots, and in some way it's written into our instincts. The sense that I'm my own agent and that, for example, the animal I'm hunting is a separate agent is as deeply and naturally felt as the feeling of hunger that's motivating me to hunt. We take it for granted because it feels so intuitive. I feel my feelings and they motivate me to take actions. I can't feel the feelings of someone else or will their actions, so me and others must be totally independent, different things. The thing we need to realize to progress as a species towards a more sensible, peaceable world is that this view of selfhood is hopelessly incorrect, despite how intuitively obvious it seems to us. That view comes from a time before humans had science to help solve the countless mysteries of the world, when the only thing we really knew about the brain was that it was a wrinkly pile of goo that fills the skull. Modern neuroscience has revealed facts about the brain's connection to selfhood that were unimaginable when ideas about the soul had already long been established as central to the story we tell about ourselves. This relatively new science boils down to this. All the experiences we have that we would traditionally associate with the soul are the result of information processing undergone by the brain. I'll bet that's not news to you. Most of us already understand the brain's connection to experience, but we haven't fully integrated that knowledge into our philosophy of selfhood, mostly because the unique soul version of it is just so thoroughly taken for granted. Imagine that I could erase everything you've ever learned about souls and religions and brains and selfhood. Now I sit you down and explain what neuroscience tells us about the brain and experience, that experiences correspond to brain information processing. I say, so anytime information is processed in the right way, experiences occur, and anytime that information processing stops, experiences stop. It's hard for me to imagine that in response you would go, ah, I get it. That means that the brain contains an everlasting soul that's separate from the rest of the universe and is non-physical, but it's nonetheless attached to that physical brain for some reason. And when that brain dies, that unique individual soul continues existing and experiencing stuff for eternity. There's nothing in the information I gave you, the information we know to be true, that suggests anything about unique, separate, individual souls. Other than tradition, there's really no reason to propose that separate souls exist at all. Those ideas only come from the wonderings of our uninformed ancestors. We don't use the wonderings of our uninformed ancestors to develop medicines or design airplanes. Why should we use them to define the most central aspect of all of us, our ideas about selfhood and the morality that follows? Our new knowledge about the brain and experience tells us that consciousness isn't some magical faculty that stands apart from the physical universe. It's fundamental to and inextricably linked to the physical universe. Think about it. The brain uses the electromagnetic field to process information, the same one that carries light from the sun to the earth, the same field of potential which exists everywhere in space. It's not the case that every brain creates a brand new electromagnetic field that's never existed before and is separate from the rest of the electromagnetic field. No, the brain just taps into the field of potential that's already there and has been there since before the earth even formed. It's the same for consciousness. It's not the case that any brain that happens to form individually invents consciousness for the first time, generating an experiencer from scratch that's separate from the rest of the universe. No, the brain instead just taps into the field of potential that's already there, the attribute of the universe that allows experiences to exist. 
In essence, if the soul is the thing that does the experiencing, then what we're talking about here is the soul of the universe. We can think of it just like we do with electromagnetism or gravity, as a field of potential which exists everywhere and always, ready to generate the sensations of living wherever an informational model of the world is constructed in the right way. This means that every experiencer, in every body, in every corner of the universe, is one and the same. It's the universe itself, looking out through a little living window into reality. So who am I? I'm the universe. Who are you? You're the universe. To be entirely clear, I'm not saying that I'm a little special version of the universe that's different from all others and is independent of everything else, like the old soul idea would say. I'm saying that I'm the universe alive in this body, and you're the universe alive in that body. To put it into familiar terms, we aren't two different souls. We share the same soul. Of course, the self you inhabit is still unique. It's your personality, interests, talents, goals, relationships, memories, all wrapped up in your particular body with its singular attributes. The thing that's not unique is who's at home, the one experiencing that one-of-a-kind set of circumstances. Underneath it all, it's forever and always the universe alone who's present for experiences that happen in the universe. This concept confuses the hell out of people I found, and maybe rightly so. One says, so I'm person A, feeling the experiences of person A. Person B is over there, feeling the experiences of person B. You're saying I'm automatically person B as well? If so, then why can't I feel the experiences of person B? To this I say you are feeling the experiences of person B, but not from the perspective of person A. You're there inside of person B at the same time, living their life too. This is because whenever a life arises to be experienced, the self-same entity wakes up in that life. It's the universe that does so, the universal faculty of consciousness. I'm not even sure what the alternative is supposed to be, really. Every single aspect of your existence is inextricably linked to the rest of the universe. You're a swarming flux of molecules that interchange with your environment day in and day out, ever breathing in and taking the environment into you, ever breathing out and leaving what was part of yourself behind. The time these particles spend as part of your body is an infinitesimal blip in their multi-billion year history and future. You're tied to the same laws of physics that enable those atoms to exist, pushed against the ground by the same gravitational field that keeps the moon in orbit. You can't lift a finger without using electromagnetism, the same electromagnetism that carries light from the most distant stars to the lens of a telescope on Earth. Every single thing about you is extended from, continuous with, and dependent on the same fundamental basis shared by everything in existence. And yet you would conclude that you nevertheless stand apart from the universe as your own independent being? We should take a moment to realize that a big part of the brain's processing goes into creating the feeling of separateness we have which motivates the separate soul idea. This brain-wide system, called the default mode network, processes information related to our sense of self, who we are, what we've done in the past, what we're capable of, what our goals are, how others see us. In essence, it keeps a running narrative going of the story of our lives, and it sets a boundary separating me, the experiential bubble we all ride around in, from not me. This is, of course, useful for an evolutionary agent that's designed to survive and propagate itself, and the brain spends considerable resources keeping it running, motivating many of our daily actions. Now, what would happen if this identity modeling system were shut off? Brain imaging studies have shown that psychedelics dramatically reduce activity in the default mode network. I think it's no coincidence then that psychedelic users commonly report experiences of ego disillusion and a profound sense of connection to others and to the universe as a whole as a result. It seems that when the neural machinery dedicated to generating our conventional sense of self is switched off, a more fundamental state of consciousness is uncovered. This is in line with Aldous Huxley's reducing valve idea, that psychedelics reveal the actual truth of selfhood by shutting off the brain's survival instinct mandated version of it. From this view, it becomes clear that there's fundamentally no separation between oneself and the rest of the universe. One is entirely continuous with, indistinguishable from, the rest of the universe. This is part of the reason why I'm so excited about the current psychedelic renaissance, that in addition to psychedelics being revolutionary for mental health therapies, they can also reveal this deeper truth about selfhood to people firsthand in a way that's impossible for me to really communicate. Now, why should this matter to you? And how can it progress our civilization and make for a more loving world, like I'm saying? I'd say that understanding this concept fully could help restrain the version of selfishness that underlies the things we despise most about the world. Things like the evil acts, cruelty, genocide, rape, murder. 
If every life is experienced by the same fundamental experiencer, the universe, then there's fundamentally nothing to be gained by taking advantage of others. Think about it. If you were a sadist who derived pleasure from knowingly causing pain in other people, but you fully understood the truth of this perspective, you would have to temper your urge to do harm because you would know that anyone on the receiving end of the pain you cause is also you. Willingly hurting someone else is like using your right hand to squeeze your left hand in a vice. The same experiencer is both causing and feeling the pain. This idea is really a lot to take in. It unfortunately means that you're the one living out all the most miserable experiences you've ever heard of. It means that even the person you despise most in the world is most fundamentally you. The same one who experiences and wills your life experiences and wills their life. All the hoarders on that TV show living in filth, all the inmates in the overcrowded, miserable prisons, that's you, you, you. It's kind of vertigo-inducing and gut-wrenching to imagine, honestly quite terrible when you think about it. Everyone who dies on the battlefield, everyone who dies of heinous diseases, everyone tortured to death, everywhere. That's you experiencing that. If that's not the worst nightmare imaginable, I don't know what is. But it's not the little you from the old soul idea. It's not the person with your name and body. It's the big you, the universal you. To me, it's a bit heartbreaking to think that the universe is powerless from the outside to stop this onslaught of experiential misery, that the universe just wakes up in whatever body's biology cooks up and has to live out the lifestyle dictated by that body's instincts and circumstances. Then again, on the other hand, every pleasant hour with friends, every first kiss, every moment spent feeling pride in one's grandchildren, every triumph and every sweet experience is also experienced by that big universal you. Maybe on balance, all the misery is worth it after all, Certainly, my personal life is stacked way towards the good side of that spectrum so far. There's something quite profoundly beautiful about this soul we all share, the one that's along for the ride and yoked to our bodies with their sometimes twitchy, nervous instincts. This is one of the great reasons to meditate, to quiet the body's say and experience, to quiet the animal story and quest that's overlaid on experience, and feel the experience that's prior to all of that and within it. That experience is what some people call their center, and it sits at the heart of all you feel. Your ego and self-image surround it, your feelings resonate through it, and it's the essence of who you are, really. It's the soul of the universe itself that exists all around, and you're the little knot that life ties onto that spiritual essence that is everywhere and is everything. Life sets up shop on that conscious fabric and takes it for a ride, forgetting all the way that it's really the everything consciousness that's solely present for the journey. The feeling we have is, this is me and everything outside is not me. Again, we're in some sense designed to feel this way because survival throughout history relied on it. An eat or be eaten organism has nothing to gain from feeling one with the prey that it's hunting or the predator it's running away from. We're still, and for the foreseeable future, entranced by this notion and trapped in the combative worldview it underlies. This is humanity's great failing, that we've progressed past an eat or be eaten existence, but we haven't escaped our eat or be eaten mindset. I see a future we can all work towards where, as living gets safer and more secure, people look out for each other almost as fully as they look out for themselves and their own. Where people look out for non-human conscious beings almost as fully as they look out for themselves. Where we let go of hatred and fear and supremacy, class and status or otherwise. Where we love each other and love life to a deeper level than an eat or be eaten illusion allows. This will be a world where people are more in touch with the universal soul at the center of all of us, the spiritual mind and experiencer at the center of everything. To get there, the natural dictum would be that a wise person should use their life to reduce suffering in the world. Included in that would of course be the work of artists and entertainers whose work makes people happier, and also the simple act of spending pleasant time with friends and family, pets, and oneself. Increasing pleasure and joy in the world is one sure way of reducing suffering. Because you have the greatest control over your own suffering, you should first take care that you aren't suffering unduly before you take on the burden of reducing the suffering of others. That's not to say that you should never suffer in the pursuit of a worthy cause, but just that one shouldn't be expected to sacrifice everything for others. Next in line is working to reduce the suffering of those closest to you, friends, family, and loved ones. This should all be easy enough because we're already naturally wired to do so. Great, so, so far this moral code says, do exactly what you're already inclined to do easy enough. The crucial next step is to ensure that minimizing suffering for yourself and your loved ones doesn't increase suffering in other people and beings further removed from you. To motivate that, I'm trying to provide your conscience with a concept it can't refuse, as it were. The concept that before you do harm to others, you can't forget that the most fundamental part of you also resides in them. 
This sets up what's effectively an obligatory golden rule, which says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, because they are you. It provides a sort of motivated utilitarianism, which is the idea that moral actions are those that do the most good for the most sentient beings. The goal is to maximize happiness for the universal self, not for one's own little corner of that self. A metaphor might help clarify the discussion. We could use good points for things like happiness, fulfillment, excitement, joy, and pleasure, and bad points for things like pain, embarrassment, and loss. If actions generate more good points than bad points, no matter what individual conscious entities they affect, they're morally desirable actions. Of course, there's no way to quantify what moral effect actions will have like this, but if you can reasonably add up all your good points and subtract from them all your bad points, you're being a good person only if that sum is zero or more. Now, that reasonable is a sticky point because it's open to self-serving rationalizations of the kind we're all abundantly familiar with. I think this ultimately can't be helped. You know if you're being honest with yourself or not, and maybe only the power of your own conscience has any real sway over just how self-convenient your rationalizations are. Notice that there's still room for imperfect altruism here. If you can feasibly rationalize an action as benefiting yourself more than it harms another, say it benefits you 100 good points and harms 50 others for one bad point, it's probably an okay action to take, again keeping in mind that it's impossible to know the true cost of any action. Taken to its conclusion, this idea should eliminate any justification for sadism or evil selfishness where you badly hurt others for your own benefit. If you get 100 good points out of hurting another person for 200 bad points, that's obviously a loss. There are tons of hypothetical situations we could ponder, but the point is that this is a sort of self-enforcing morality. If you really understand it, then you know that actions that hurt others are actually hurting yourself. Because of this, selfishness is fundamentally foolish. Someone who takes advantage of other people for their own benefit is unwittingly taking advantage of their self. Selfish or evil actions, those that cause others pain, are like cutting off the nose to spite the face. In the end, even if everyone is convinced of this idea, we're not all going to be automatic saints. I've believed this idea for years and have tried to live in line with it, and while I think it's helped me be a kinder, more compassionate person, I'm definitely no saint. The old soul idea where each of us is a separate self apart from the universe and all others is just so deeply ingrained. Things like jealousy, envy, greed, selfishness, these don't just disappear when we take what I see as this wiser view that we are all part of the same self. The older view is instinctual and habitual, and our world is set up in its context, so it can be really hard to escape. It also remains useful to have an ego and some self-advocacy to operate as a person in the world as it's set up. If you go full selfless at this stage, less enlightened people will walk all over you. When you inevitably have to compete for scarce resources in one form or another, at least be sporting about it. But going so far as to believe that glorifying yourself is the only worthy goal in the world marks you as an embarrassing, willfully ignorant fool in my book. It can also feel a bit intrusive to tell others you believe this idea that we all share the same self. I'm there inside of you looking out and you're here inside of me looking out is kind of a weird statement but mostly just because it's unfamiliar to us. On the other hand, once you get used to it, it engenders a calming sense of familiarity with everyone you encounter, like, ah, there goes me from another lifetime. I find it easier to put myself in other people's shoes from this view, where I know that I'm also in their shoes. I hope you find the same. <laughs>